In March 2024, the CSIRO research vessel Investigator embarked on a voyage risking harsh sea conditions in the pursuit of scientific discovery. This is the story of the adventurers aboard. After settling into our cabins and waving farewell to the pilot boat, the ship left Waliala Fremantle, beginning its journey to Nipaluna Hobart. On board were not only scientists, crew and support staff, but also a cohort of third-year undergraduate students. This time is kind of special. I'm, I've brought a class, the unit's called KSA 324, which is Oceanographic Methods. Um, I brought the class along to get some at-sea training on the RV Investigator. So we're doing a whole range of things and uh, it's a little bit dependent on what science is occurring on the ship. For us and um, the actual unit, we're going to be collecting a range of underway samples, which means it's just seawater that's coming into the vessel while we're steaming ahead. And we're analysing for chlorophyll A, which is uh, pigment in phytoplankton, and then also the nutrients, uh, so the macronutrients, nitrate, phosphate, silicate. That's what we're sampling at the moment. Awesome. And what brings you on to the RV Investigator? We're studying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Best, best field trip ever. <laughs> oh, I love that. That'll be the slogan that they use to advertise in the future. And I think that will be a, one amazing experience. Uh, like we can um, get onto boat for 12 days and uh, uh, do like uh, many sampling and uh, learn about um, uh, sample like uh, chlorophyll or something in laboratory. Mm -hmm. And uh, we learn a lot of um, knowledge on the boat. When I was in high school, <laughs> I did a good job in biology and it really inspired me to uh, dig into this field and, and now I seem to find a new, new career or a new direction to my survey. It's just good to see in real life all these things we've been learning about for the past three years. Like we learn about a CTD and that Niskan bottles and they go in the water and they come back up. but and actually be there for it, like, it just clicks. You get a, like, light bulb in your head, I guess. In the early hours of the day, a team began their prep for one of the main projects of the voyage. So what we've been doing is we basically throw down a big metal bucket. Um, so it's hard edge and a mesh kind of a bag behind it and we lay it down on the sea, we put it all the way down five about thousand metres below the water and and then we drag it up a slope and we hope that we <laughs> we hit some rocks and they break off and, and go in our in our bag mm -hmm. and then we drag it all the way back up to the top and it's a bit like it's quite exciting it's a bit like a like a lucky dip you know at, the, at an old-fashioned school fair you know where you, you stick your hand in and you just don't know if you're going to get any rocks at all or if you're going to get good rocks. Or if you're just going to scoop up a tub of mud. The mud is mud. That is, that is that's mud. Pelagic ooze. And so it's time to try again. And this time, the winch pulling the lucky dip up is showing some tension, signalling that it might have caught on some rocks. Yay! <laughs> that's so good! <laughs> So we came on the ship because we were really interested in getting some rocks from really deep in the Great Australian Bight from, from the ocean floor. There's some ridges that we can see on some um, data that we had before and we were really keen to get some samples of those ridges to try to find out what they were made out of. What is the Great Australian Bight? Ah, okay, yeah. So the Great Australian Bight is the, you know, if you look at a map of Australia and you've got... Um, 
you know, you look at the southern margin all the way sort of from, you know, you're up there at Perth and then you come south and you come around and it's sort of the whole of the southern part of Australia kind of curves inward up towards Adelaide and then it goes back south again, sort of pokes back down towards Melbourne and, and, and Tassie. So I guess we call that that bit, that the curved in bit, the Great Australian Bite. And the first step of studying the rocks is to slice them up. After which, we head into the lab to have a closer look. So my job here was to characterise the rocks and make sure the geology side of things as well, um, we, we sample correctly um, for future analyses essentially. So yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I had a lot of fun. So the first dredge came up and then I had a whole team of workers and I was like, oh, now what do I do? I have to put everyone to work. So it was quite a production line and everyone was, it was, we crushed it. It was so glad I had so much help because we had another dredge and these guys, we had everything sorted by that night. G'day, I'm Luke. Uh, we've just done dredge two. It's a great success. We've got blocks full of rocks. We've been cutting them up on the diamond saws. And I'll take you through to, um, into our lab. And you can see what the team has been doing. So we've got some lovely seafloor sediment came in on one of the buckets and then as you can see we've got a whole team of workers here from Utah's so cleaning rocks that have been freshly cut <laughs> and then we've got a team of geologists here that are diligently describing each rock and giving them labels and, and sample numbers and then there's a group over here that are curating them into bags with their labels, taking photos. And just for interest sake, so you can see some of the samples here. We've got a manganese nodule, which is pretty cool. It's like a concretion that's formed on the sea floor. And we've got rocks like this that are totally different. They're not round like that. You can see they're angular. And when you have a look inside, you can actually see fenacris. So this is a basalt. Um, the, the, the lava flow on the sea floor. So there are some of the rocks that came off this knoll at five and a half kilometres below the sea surface. How cool. Cool. Thanks. All right. And Katie. <laughs> Again. <laughs> to be able to achieve the collection of such treasures from the ocean, it takes a whole lot of behind the scenes magic from the engineering team. And luckily, we were allowed a glimpse of this magic. My name is Gennar. I'll take you around, which is going to take probably about two hours. Please watch your steps. Do not rush. You've got time for that. And most important, when you go around, do not push any buttons. The red one or green one. Uh, try not to... Some stuff is moving, so try not to put your hands there. Um, and again, we're going to start from here. The RV Investigator is 94 metres in length and 18.5 metres in width. At 37 metres tall, the ship has 10 storeys in total. And with specialised container facilities and laboratories, the RV Investigator can facilitate a wide range of scientific projects. Beneath the laboratories, where researchers spend their time, is an expansive maze of equipment facilitating their work. This includes a variety of winches, such as this one, and the one that made rock dredging at depths below 5,000 metres possible. And down here, the maze feels endless. It's not just making research possible that engineers are responsible for, but also keeping everyone on board safe and afloat, as well as keeping the ship moving. And to do that takes some pretty loud engines.
And just when we thought we'd gone as far down into the belly of the ship as we could, it continued even further. But the most startling part of our tour was after we had gone back upstairs and been led through a door next to the galley to have a peek at the drop keel. See <laughs> you. Oh damn. Oh my god. Can you, can you, see, can you see the sun? Sunlight? Yeah. Oh my god. Sometimes you can see the fish. Fish? Fish? What? Is that my lunch? After the tour, it's back up to the deck to watch one of the greatest assets of the RV investigator, the CTD Rosette. It's so calm. Where do all the waves go? Here it comes up into the door. After watching the side of the ship open up, the CTD Rosette is taken out over the water before being sent down to the ocean depths below. And on this voyage, it even managed to make it past 6,000 meters below the sea surface. As the CTD Rosette returns to the surface, it stops at certain intervals to collect water samples. Up to which, uh, 500 dB, please. So much fun. <laughs> but for those not calling out the depths from the operations room, we can watch as the CTD Rosette starts to come back into view. Up she comes! Woo! <laughs> Swing! After breaking the surface, the CTD Rosette is brought back safely onto the ship. This is science. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's time to head downstairs and for the scientists and students to get to work. So on top of the underway samples that they're collecting, they're also going to be sampling from the CTD, which is is great experience for them. Um, they're getting trained by not just myself, but also by hyd hydrochemists on board and other scientists that have specific requirements for their samples. Um, so they're going to be sampling on the CTD for dissolved oxygen, nutrients, uh, salinity, and then chlorophyll as well. So we get both the horizontal distribution of chlorophyll and nutrients away, uh, along our transect and also some vertical distribution along for all of the CTDs. So the CTD is really the, the workhorse of oceanographers, is what we call it. And so that CTD stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. And so it measures really the three things that we care about in the ocean, which is pressure, that gives you depth, temperature, which is important for the amount of heat in the ocean. And then uh, conductivity is actually a proxy that we use for salinity. And so temperature and salinity are the two things that drive 
density in the ocean, which eventually drives motion. So it's very important. I think I'd just have to say my most memorable, treasured memories uh, <laughs> moment would be when we're doing um, the Xth number CTD sample. You know, we've done a fair few of these, and the last few ones we just had the radio on in the background. We're all having a little bit of a boogie yeah. while we're doing the water sampling. It's particularly good because for one of them, you have to um, to shake a flask to really mix the reagents in there. So it's really good to have a bit of a backtrack to that. And that was just a bit of a like a happy, sweet moment with everyone. <laughs> Yeah, the dancing dance. Yeah, the dancing dance. Thank you, Noah. Oh gosh. Okay. Look at these things. QB tainers, they're called. Any idea why? No. That's the thumb on top. Thumb on top. Dealer dancing dance. Dance. Yes. Yeah, good teacher. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No bubbles. No bubbles. Nice. That was cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look how cold the bubble was. Hi, Lily Blue. Yeah. And put the lid on, and then. Put it upside down. Oh, ready for testing. And by testing, she means how behind every great CTD Rosette deployment is a great hydrochemistry team conducting water sampling and analyses. Uh, I'm a part of hydrochemistry team. We usually collect the CTD new water samples, seawater samples, where we check the health of the seawater, the ocean health by understanding the nutrient profile and salts and dissolved oxygen content of seawater. And so what does a day on the RV investigator look like for you? Uh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> the first thing we get the, when we are, we are very eagerly waiting for the CTD, that's where our work starts. We usually get the new, like seawater samples, then we are always like we get ready for the instrumentation to get uh, everything will be ready mm -hmm. for the analysis. Mm -hmm. First, we do the dissolved oxygen and salts and nutrient analysis. Yep. After getting the CTD, where usually for salts it may take around within 24 hours we finish the salts, and D was also in the same. But nutrients within four hours we have to complete. Whenever we get the samples, we do the nutrients. Mm -hmm. Usually. We only take the 12 liters, the, uh, the representative of the bulk, what we have, the seawater. Mm -hmm. We only collect 100 ml, uh, 200 ml for salt samples and uh, around 100 ml for dissolved oxygen and uh, around 30 to 50 ml of, for nutrient analysis. Mm -hmm. You never feel bored of work and you enjoy what you are doing. Yeah, that's where we love everything, whatever we do here. And there's yet another team studying the water samples collected, but this time by using this funky machine. Uh, so Eric and I are on board the investigator um, as part of our oceanomics program, collecting some eDNA samples, that's environmental DNA samples from the ocean, looking at trying to characterise fish biodiversity in this region. And there are a variety of tools and methods that are currently used to kind of assess and monitor the state or the health of the environments, but eDNA is really easy. Like you take two liters of water, filter it, extract the DNA from it, analyze, and you can get everything from viruses, bacteria, fish, all the way up to whales. And it's a tool that you can de deploy across like large, vast and time scales. So um, really ideal for marine parks in Australia. DNA going through the <laughs> It's actually a bit random. Yeah, I was going to say, that felt wrong. <laughs> I was like, I don't know much, but I think I know it's going on. Way. Way. Wait, one more time, sorry, I was laughing. <laughs> oh, the Nisky. <laughs> After all that hard work, it's time to rest and feed up. 
And I gotta say, we most definitely got spoiled by the chefs on board. And while they made it look easy preparing such delicious food, it most definitely is not an easy job preparing to feed so many mouths. All right, <laughs> so yes, uh, Bonnie, this is the, the main dry store that we've got on, on the vessel. So the maximum people that can be carried on board the ship is 60 people. Mm -hmm. So trying to uh, negotiate and think and get your crystal ball out to try to sort of like uh, order food for 60 people for 60 days is quite a quite a minefield as i said just earlier on because i reckon most people at home wouldn't even know what they want to eat in four weeks time mm -hmm. so we've got to try to project what stores we need and the volume mm -hmm. of what we need on on the vessel to try to accommodate stuff that we need for long voyages shorter voyages are easier but what we do try to do is accommodate as much as we can for as long as we can. But certain items we do run out of, especially in fresh because it goes goes off and that sort of thing. But with the, the dry stores, you know, we still can run out because we don't really know what people are going to eat. We can only surmise what people want. So sometimes they want more of what we've got. So we run out earlier and other stuff that they don't want so much, obviously we will have towards mm. the end of the towards the end of the voyage. Ooh. So do you want to go to the fridges? And yes, please. Right, just going to enter the uh, bedroom. So obviously, yeah, as it states, it's all, like all the vegetables, all the fresh veg, and the preparation shelf. Oh, that was delicious. <laughs> that was so good. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is what we just called the dairy fridge. So like the cheeses, the butter, the yogurts, eggs. What's your favourite meal? Oh, Look at my tummy and it tell you I'll eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm pretty easy to please as long as it's not got celery in it. Oh, oh the This fridge. is uh, the freezer. Oh, wow. Um, once again, it's pretty fed up, but it's uh, not as full as it could be. The super dupers. I'd only ever had one super duper. Why have you only had one? Life. No, no, no. Before I came. Oh, on the trip. before you come in. Now I have at least one a day. Oh, keep They're the great. doctor away. Okay, yeah. Ronnie. It's all right. Ollie comes in, just takes a little look around the, the galley with her. Uh, Ollie. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Exciting to be on this side of the, the view. Yeah, it's a totally different ship. Thanks for all the food. No problem at all. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> While nearly all of our meals were eaten in the galley, one of them wasn't. <laughs> the music. Yeah, beautiful. Stick on the plate. Thanks, Kenna. Is there any more steak, Kenna? And this was a very special moment because you don't get to see this many people at once on board because of everyone's different work and sleeping schedules. And speaking of work schedules, it's time for another lucky dip. But this time we're collecting microplastics and it's back to the lab to inspect them. Now one of the biggest problems with studying microplastics, especially on a ship, is that there is a lot of plastic involved. <laughs> including the net. So we run a lot of controls by flushing water through these and essentially run filtered water through every stage of the cycle. So again, I'll just preface that the methods we use for doing the zooplankton communities are very different to the methods that we use for the microplastic community. So in this instance, it doesn't matter if the zooplankton community is exposed to all of these elements, exposed to tap water, exposed to tap water coming out of plastic hoses, and all of those sort of things, so they're a little bit nicer to learn on. So Katie, what I'll get you to do is if you want to turn on that top tap on the right hand side, yep, and then water will come out of here. And then what you want to do is you want to create pressure just like you would with a garden hose and just use that to rinse the outside of the mesh down into the bottom of the pot end. Yep, and don't be afraid to get the hose nice and close. 
because zooplankton is quite sticky and gelatinous, so it will be stuck to the edge. <laughs> you will splash yourself. <laughs> it is quite wet work. And then once you're happy with that, what we'll do is we'll pour the contents into the sieve and we're going to do a couple more rinses. Great job. Perfect. Good work. So what we want to do is we want to try and pile all of the plankton into that edge. Too. <laughs> um, because that's going to make our life a lot easier when we tip the plankton into that container. So I'm just going to use the filtered millicue and we're going to wash that all down into that bottom corner. Okay. And now you can see it's all sort of pulled down in that bottom. As you can see. And we'll just try and drain off as much water as we can because what we're doing is we're going to preserve the plankton in 70% ethanol and that keeps the form of the plankton stable so that when we take it back to the, our lab, um, they haven't been damaged and their body and their morphology is gonna survive. Perfect. That's the worst of it. It's all right. <laughs> nice and clean, well done. If anyone has any suggestions on how to make this less wet and messy, I'm open to hearing them. <laughs> Big screen. Yeah. A big box would be handy. <laughs> and that is how we would process one of the nets. So at each station we have three nets dedicated to zooplankton communities. That is how we would do one. Um, in this instance, we're just going to pull them all into the one container because it's going to be a mixed one for you all to just have a look and play at. Now the lab isn't just for science, but we also got to have a little creative afternoon decorating Argo floats before their deployment. So those are probably the coolest thing in the oceanographic world. They're called Argo floats. Um, so they're basically autonomous platforms that profile the ocean um, continuously without us even thinking about it. There's thousands of them around the globe doing this in a continuous manner to have a global coverage. It's kind of a work beyond the scenes kind of thing that provides a tremendous amount of information that has changed our field of research quite a lot, uh, more than people actually think about. Um, but those Argo floats collect a ton of information about, about the ocean, and RBR is now a new contributor to that program, um, providing uh, sensors for that program that has very, very high expectations about in terms of accuracy and performance of the sensors. They kind of set the bar for everybody else in the world of oceanography. Mm -hmm. And so this is all the work we're doing here is trying to demonstrate that they can actually be put on those floats confidently and that you can rely on the data to be really good data. And once we'd finished decorating them, it was time to chuck the Argo floats overboard so that they could go and collect their important data. While it would have been easy to spend the whole day staring out to sea, it was much more enjoyable to hide from the overcast skies by gathering together in the lounge to hear about each other's work during daily talks. This gave a chance for everyone to hear more from the different teams and experts on the ship, and we got to learn from ecologists, geophysicists, oceanographers, biologists, geologists, and were even lucky enough to hear stories about taking motorbikes to Antarctica many years ago. <laughs> this is pretty neat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and watch the smile on his face. <laughs> That's it. As 
I was on the trip to represent the That's What I Call Science show, I wanted to hear more about everyone's stories and I was super lucky to interview 26 keen beans that were happy to come on the mic and most of those interviews were conducted on the same day. I think this voyage has just 100% confirmed how cool marine science is and like how much I'd love to go into it. For me, it's confirmed that that's what I really want to do. Really want to go into oceanography and be on research vessels such as the RV Investigator. So I'm the chief scientist on this voyage. There's a lot of different science on this trip. I guess I'm in charge of coordinating between all those different groups and making sure everybody's getting their time that they need. We're a sailing family, so to be able to, I guess, combine that passion with, with my passion for IT and data is uh, what drew me to the role. I travelled this way to uh, join the RV Investigator's geo geophysical mapping and survey team, and so I'm getting hands-on experience with all the systems you use. The Oceanomics program uh, is an initiative from the Mindrew Foundation, where we're trying to scale up um, new technologies such as environmental DNA and genomic monitoring tools to kind of better quantify what lives in the ocean. So if we know what is there, we can also better protect it. I'll tell you, catering is a lot better than most terrestrial field work. I'm with the DEP team, that's the data acquisition and processing team. We're responsible for collecting all of the data and making sure that it's collected in a high quality um, manner and then archived appropriately and organized. So I'm here as part of a collaborative project with uh, Australian researchers and it's all about trying to uh, better understand oceanographic instrumentation and see how well they perform when you send them to very deep waters. All of the other scientists have also mentioned that it's lovely to have the, the students on board. They've also just brought that enthusiasm and that, that energy. Well, it was luck that, you know, sort of collaborating with Jackie Halpin and knowing those crew, they sort of invited me along, so it was a, I was very lucky. But I didn't realise how flexible marine science was. Like, I didn't realise kind of how many avenues you could really go down within the one discipline. But it's been really good to get a lot of hands-on skills um, and experiences, particularly with all the other scientists being so keen to have us on board and help them out. So uh, George and Lana are part of my research team here on board the RV Investigator. So we're looking at microplastic pollution and each of them plays a separate role within my team. And yeah, they're a great team to work with. When you have the geology base work, it's quite interesting to hear about Earth's history from the experts on board. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the best part of the sea life is interacting with various people, like the science team and supporting staff. Mm -hmm. Here, the people are so good. Mm -hmm. Everyone is so lovely, and we all enjoy working together. Heading back downstairs to the ops room, and there's yet another team working hard down there endlessly. So I work with the geophysical survey and mapping team, bit of a mouthful, and my role on board is to run all the acoustic instruments that map life in the water column, map the sea floor, and map below the sea floor. Here it's science and research focused, where we're collecting the data to give to other science teams so that they can utilize it for their uh, projects as well. Um, but between mapping the seafloor, um, mapping the sub-bottom of the seafloor, there's so many applications, to, even from you know, charting and habitat mapping and geophysical hazards and offshore construction like can all benefit from the data we collect here. And um, my role is, sea, is a seagoing role. Um, so I guess uh, we expected to do about 80 to 85 days a year on Investigator. Obviously with COVID, COVID that number was reduced. So um, yeah, I'm trying to think uh, how many I've done now, but it's been a lot. I'm starting to forget Voyage yeah. from Voyage. They're all very cool <laughs> and uh, they're all very different and diverse as well. But uh, it's been a lot um, since uh, 2018 in March when I joined. The crowds that you can see building here were because of the excitement of a potential shipwreck finding. And while we didn't actually find any, there were a few close calls. Well, I might go for further investigation with the camera one day. Yeah. But that's certainly an interesting one that it's so proud of the seafloor. Four metres, I mean, that's a, that's a good distance from the seafloor. Leaving the ops room behind, you can climb up and up the 10 stories of the RV investigator 
to get to the very top of the ship, where the best views can be found. So this is the way I While it's a great spot up there for sunrise watching, that's not all you can watch out for from up there. Things to look out for are the colours on the top of the wings. Colour underneath. So see that? So see how it's almost exclusively white underneath? Yeah. Just really thin black margins. So if you pull over, so there's, there's a turn. See, quick. So I, need, I need someone on data entry. <laughs> turn and kill. Guys on it. There we go. Dark tail, really wide underneath. They migrate. That's a shy albatross. Hey, Ben. Migrate. Which turn we go again? Crested turn. We found ourselves a shy albatross. That one. Oh, that's my friend study species. Yeah. They're beautiful. Look at all the Oh, now you're in trouble. I keep counting. They're all coming across. Who's got the clicker? Seabirds, seals and whales are often surveyed from ships for both ecological studies as well as ensuring the presence and activities of ships aren't affecting them. Given that ship work is not 9 to 5, Downtime and relaxation is important to slot into your schedule when you can. You can relax with movie nights, craft time, or even the occasional magic trick. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Oh my god. You got it Wait, what? It was, it was the other way around. <laughs> well done. Four of clubs, five of spades. I knew I shouldn't have done it with you. Uh, most Chuck of the time. Chuck Diamond, that's it? <laughs> that was your card. Yeah. How did you know? How? How did you know? Clue? Clue? Yeah. 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 And you can even play competitive sports too, should you wish. <laughs> Take 40, let's go. We can do this. We can do this. Come on, Katie. We believe in you. Do it for the elbow. You got it, you got it, you got it. You split the ten though, so it's Is this the throw that wins the game? Yeah! There's lots of other ways to hang out and socialise with others on board. Video games and board games are a great way to pass the time out at sea and also find out who's a fair tradesperson and who's going to trick you into giving up all your wheat for only one brick. 14, 15, 16. Well done. <laughs> for those with the most heightened competitive spirits on board, we even had a backgammon tournament going, and this was truly where the friendships were tested. Uh, okay. oh, there we go. Two doubles in a row. I reckon we should go. Well, what is it? Rigged dice. Uh, Hello, okay. welcome to the second semi final of the Cresswell Cup. Twenty twenty four. Okay, here we go. One nice thing. Three, two, one, go. On the rock. Oh, 
Six for Sophia! And three for Ollie. Brilliant. Absolute brilliant there. Sophia moves six and three. Here comes Ollie now. Do I have an advantage? Four and a one! Oh my word, what a move! I always have to think which way I'm coming. Yeah. Five and a one there. Oh, brilliant sprite, Ollie. And then he's going to get me. And we have the grand final of the backgammon tournament. 11 days at sea has led to this moment. Sophia actually taught Noah. Noah taught others. The crowds are gathering. There could be a riot. The ED and A team don't care. They're doing their own thing. That would be fun. Who's going to be flipping the board when they get angry? Yeah, so that was, was there. It, no, sorry. What are you doing? It was like this. Yeah. And then oh. No, no, no. Okay. We have okay, a sorry. contention on the board. Oh, yeah, um, we can, have no, a can we, contention. Can we, can we can we Do you want to? And I'm sorry, 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 oh, sorry, oh, folks. We're just gonna. Oh my god! It is kicking. Oh my god! The finals bring in a different dynamic to backgammon. It's no longer a peaceful game. George is starting to lose it. George has taken my time. He wanted to be involved. And we have reached a resolution. There has been a conflict resolution in the situation, and we have continued with the game. Is this the throw? It is. That wins the game. It'd be pretty difficult for it not to be. It hey. is. And good we have game, a Noah. winner. Good game, Sophia. That's so good. <laughs> Alas, all good things must come to an end. And Loot Tree to Tasmania came into our sights, beckoning us home with gloriously sunny views of a picturesque landscape. Though this is Tassie, so naturally those gloriously sunny views had a time limit. <laughs> This morning was nice. Oh, this morning was good, but this is We are crossing the treacherous, rugged Southern Ocean. <laughs> Luckily, we are guided by the light on shore. <laughs> Which has just stopped. We just stopped. He's on a roll. But the grey skies lifted and home came into view. <laughs> oh, is this a participation award? It's so is a participation award. It's a new thing, I've never had this before. <laughs> Patch. You get a patch, you get a patch, I get a patch. Thank you. And at last, it was time to head back to reality, where further analyses of rocks, seawater and microplastics awaited each of us. And unfortunately, so did having to cook our own dinners. Oh, so this is what it's been like for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I had considered putting duct tape so you can't see yourself. Yeah. That is pretty alarming. Sorry. <laughs> You're so yellow. <laughs> yellow. <laughs> I think yellow. you just compared to everything else. You're the only thing that shows up bright on the camera. <laughs> You're so <All> right. yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I have a haiku uh, that I've written about the voyage to try and sum it all up a little bit. Uh, so, ocean hues evolve, voyage of discovery, science in motion. <laughs>